September 23rd saw the release of Bob Iger's memoirs, in which no end of interesting tidbits about the inner workings of Disney, Lucasfilm and Marvel were released. Nothing too scandalous, of course. Iger will still run the company for some time to come, and he has presidential ambitions after that. Don't you doubt for a second that at least part of the motivation behind releasing this book is positioning himself for that. But there are some interesting tidbits here nonetheless. One of these interesting tidbits pertains to George Lucas and his views on how Star Wars has been run under Disney's rule. And if in light of recent failures, they are now more willing to entertain his ideas. In this video, we will detail what is known about George Lucas' original plans for the sequel trilogy, how he responded to The Force Awakens upon its release, and if there is any chance his influence could still be felt in the upcoming Rise of Skywalker. The background story here is that George Lucas actually wrote treatments for a whole new sequel trilogy which he handed over to Disney, with the understanding that these were the movies Disney would make, only for Disney to discard his trilogy plans and go in a completely different direction. But what were those original plans? They are about to be revealed. But before they are, I must remind you that YouTube has made a change to the algorithm. Which is why you, for the last couple of months, have been getting more and more videos from corporate channels in your recommendations, and not necessarily stuff you ever asked for. Well, that happens at the expense of independent commentary such as this. Which is why most of your favorite independent channels have taken a hit in the same time frame. If you do like the content we make, then please help us out by liking the video, watching it till the end, and if you really like it, then help share it. All of that will help us traverse the obstacles independent channels have been presented with as of late. With that out of the way. While Lucas never wrote any complete scripts for a new trilogy, he did write story treatments for three movies that were sufficiently detailed that any competent writer should be able to expand them into completed scripts. And he did so before Disney acquired Lucasfilm. When they did, they also got the rights to these treatments, and Lucas even got the understanding that Disney would use them as a basis for their new trilogy. Clearly, this did not happen. According to Bob Iger, it was him, Kathleen Kennedy and Alan Horn that together decided that the direction Lucas had staked out for them wasn't the one they wanted to take. Instead, they came up with a new direction with filmmaker J.J. Abrams. This new direction did, however, recycle elements from the treatments George Lucas wrote, although in a very different form and context than what he had envisioned. We only know bits and pieces of what was in Lucas' original and discarded treatments, but from various leaks and other references, we do know that. Apparently, Lucas' initial plan for Star Wars Episode 7 was that Luke Skywalker over the course of the movie would rediscover his vitality, so he probably wouldn't be in a good place when the movie begun, but his spirits would probably have risen as he trained a new Jedi, named Kira, at the site of an ancient Jedi temple. Over the course of the trilogy, Lucas also intended to explore what amounts to the Star Wars equivalent of Marvel's Quantum Realm, and in the process, introduce the audience to the Wills. Lucas actually got the idea for the Wills long time ago, so they are not a new invention. You know the opening scrolls to all the Star Wars movies? Well, Lucas at one point intended for these to be excerpts from the Book of the Wills, who would tacitly serve as the all-knowing narrators. In James Cameron's book, The Story of Science Fiction, Lucas said, Back in the day, I used to say ultimately what this means is that we're just cars, vehicles, for the wills to travel around in. We're vessels for them. And the conduit is the midichlorians. The midichlorians are the ones that communicate with the wills. The wills in a general sense. They are the force. I guess this might have been a big revelation in episode 8. We know little else about it. But in episode 9, Luke would have trained Leia in the ways of the force before he himself died towards the very end of it. So Disney bought all of these treatments, 
but as Iger made abundantly clear, Disney were under no obligation to actually use them. They could strip mine them for elements though, which they did. You can see where they went different. Abrams and his company decided for Luke Skywalker to be in hiding up until the very end of The Force Awakens, so Kira, renamed into Rey, could get the spotlight, while Han Solo could be killed off without ever being reunited with Luke. In The Last Jedi, there was that ancient Jedi monastery, and Abrams probably fully intended for Luke to train Rey there. But then came Ryan Johnson, and he subverted those expectations now, didn't he? But that's alright, it didn't really derail anything. Rey is too awesome to be taught anything by a man like Luke Skywalker. She already intuitively know everything he could possibly teach her. No mention of any wills though. In his book, Iger makes it clear that while Disney were under no legal obligation to actually make their movies based on Lucas' outlines, Lucas himself was under the impression that Disney were going to essentially finish the story that he had started. Iger writes, Early on, Kathleen Kennedy brought J.J. Abrams and Michael Ange up to Northern California to meet with George at his ranch and talk about their ideas for the film. George immediately got upset as they began to describe the plot and it dawned on him that they weren't using one of the stories he submitted during the negotiations. He didn't get any less upset when he saw the finished movie. About that, Iger said. Just prior to the global release, Kathy screened The Force Awakens for George. He didn't hide his disappointment. There's nothing new, he said. In each of the films in the original trilogy, it was important to him to present new worlds, new stories, new characters, and new technologies. In this one, he said, there weren't enough visual or technical leaps forward. He wasn't wrong, but he also wasn't appreciating the pressure we were under to give ardent fans a film that felt quintessentially Star Wars. We'd intentionally created a world that was visually and tonally connected to the earlier films, not to stray too far from what people loved and expected. And George was criticizing us for the very thing we were trying to do. Looking back with the perspective of several years and a few more Star Wars films, I believe JJ achieved the near impossible, creating a perfect bridge between what had been and what was to come. And then Ryan Johnson came. If Lucas didn't like The Force Awakens for not bringing anything new to the table, I'd love to hear his thoughts on The Last Jedi. And one day, maybe we will hear his thoughts on that movie. Because Iger also revealed that although he wanted Lucas to sign an NDA preventing him from talking about Disney Star Wars movies in anything but the most glowing of terms, he didn't pressure Lucas on this, so no NDA was signed. When Disney bought Lucasfilm for $4 billion, a huge part of that was paid with Disney stock, and Lucas made it clear that as a Disney shareholder, it was not in his best interest to speak out against what Disney were doing, so he wouldn't. But there is nothing legally preventing him from doing so. George Lucas himself obviously does not comment on this in Iger's memoirs, but in the aforementioned book by James Cameron, The Story of Science Fiction, Lucas lamented not being able to make the movies the way he intended and said, all the way back to, with The Force Awakens and the Jedi and everything, the whole concept of how things happened was laid out completely from the beginning to the end, but I never got to finish. I never got to tell people about it. If I held onto the company, I could have done it, and then it would have been done. Of course, a lot of the fans would have hated it, just like they did The Phantom Menace and everything, but at least the whole story from beginning to end would be told. Well, he might get his chance still. In his memoirs, Iger also made it clear that when Disney bought Lucasfilm, they also bought Lucas Services as a consultant, so should they need him, he has to answer the call. We have heard from our sources that as has been widely rumored, that call went out when the rise of Skywalker was being put together. While Abrams is free to take or leave his advice, Lucas did have the opportunity to give his take on where they should go next. Since Lucas had a very specific vision for the sequel trilogy, I would imagine he'd still want to save as much as possible of that vision. A while back, 
we put out a video compiling the leaks about where the story in Rise of Skywalker could go. Many of these will be misdirects, but some could be legit. I would say that good candidates for the legit ones include Luke training Leia in flashbacks. Her Mary Poppins powers had to come from somewhere. And the Wills being part of the story. You'll recall, this is what Lucas originally wanted for his episode 9. And if he did have the opportunity to influence how things turned out in Rise of Skywalker, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the direction he pushed for. Disney doesn't have to listen, of course. But Star Wars, right now, is such a hot mess for them. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. What we are hearing from our sources is that right now, Star Wars is in a state of emergency. As usual, you should take anything that cannot be independently verified with a grain of salt. But what we're hearing is that while the $4 billion investment Lucasfilm represented looked good around the time of The Force Awakens, it's all gone downhill since then. The toys don't sell in the numbers that they would like, or that will keep third-party licensees interested in coming back for more. Solo flopping offset a lot of what The Last Jedi had earned, and Galaxy's Edge is turning into a nightmare for them, both financially and PR-wise. Its underperformance has hit the mainstream, but it's even worse than what has previously been let on. We've even heard claims that the highest attended day was the Free Employees and Families Day, on which there obviously wasn't much to collect in terms of ticket revenue. Galaxy's Edge is such an epic failure to the max, that on September 23rd, the same day Iger's memoirs were released, Catherine Powell, the president of Disney's Parks Western Region, who oversaw the making of Galaxy's Edge, quote-unquote, left the company. That's code for her being fired. How The Mandalorian will perform is still anyone's guess. But what drives the Star Wars brand more than any TV series is the movies. Rise of Skywalker has to work. It has to fix this. To this end, I would not be overtly surprised if they gave Lucas ideas some more serious consideration, since how well their own ideas worked out is, shall we say, up for debate. And if Rise of Skywalker doesn't work out the way they hope, well then they really have to pull out all the stops on what comes next. Then they really have to bring out the big guns, like, you know, Kevin Feige. So, do you think we'll see the Wills and Leia receiving Jedi training in the upcoming movie, like George would have wanted? Or are we getting something completely different? Is it even salvageable at this point? Let me know in the comments. And if you like this kind of content and analysis, please help share.